Welcome to the Drupal Boop Doop Doop Digital Dudes Podcast. I hope you keep that. Of course. There's no editing. Okay. You, know the, you know the rules. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm still waiting for you to say. Oh, it. yeah. I'm David. I'm, uh, I'm Reed. <laughs> and we're here with special guest. Chelsea. Last name? Schoenhout. Schoenhout. Oh, nice. That's really a beautiful last name. Yeah. Well, only how she says it, not how I say it. Well, that's what I was going to say. We would have butchered it, but. (laughs) I was going to say, well, a direct German translation is beautiful skin. Wow. (laughs) And you back it up. I don't know if the camera's (laughs) catching this, but she's she's glowing. (laughs) And Chelsea, what do you do here? I am the web product manager. All right. Just fresh off the boat. Fresh off the boat. Yeah, absolutely. This is uh, week four. Cool. Well, Reed, uh, Chelsea was telling me a story. right before we started. So Chelsea, I'll let you give that story. Yeah. Uh, so yesterday I uh, listened to the, uh, you know, Digital Becoming a Product Company podcast and you guys had shouted me out a few times and uh, David had specifically told the story of how we went for our a lunch at one point and um, we had talked about the podcast and uh, I had asked, you know, how do you guys prepare? And he was kind of like, well, we just we just kind of wing it. And he, like, a uh, direct quote is he's like, she hyperventilated. <laughs> and she said that was not something she could do. And then so last week at our one on one, David had asked, like, hey, you know, at some point we'd like to have you on the podcast. Like, how much notice do you need? You know, how far in advance do you need to be aware? And I was like, I mean, I would appreciate like a day or two. So yeah, he uh, he messaged me in Slack at uh, what like three forty five or two forty five, two forty five. Hey, and I was You're like, is, is this a test? <laughs> like, is this real? Like, okay, yeah. play cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think uh, that's not a lot of notice, which clearly has not been the first time. But I think Ryan still holds the record. Yeah. So Ryan uh, Dorhout, our our controller, we. Um, I don't know if we were just hard up for material or I, we I had think cancellation. The problem is we had three weeks booked of guests and then their stuff had to get shuffled. So that's like even uh, today with Chelsea, we had a guest that got moved. So right, right. And the shuffling, you know, we're we're not totally prepared for for that scenario. Yeah, we don't have other we than should us, probably we're... have like some backups or something. <laughs> yeah, like this yeah. is like a yeah. you know, emergency one. But yeah. usually we you know, we'll then riff to your point, Chelsea, but then uh it happened to us three weeks in a row. Mm. Uh, to be clear, though, we are now booked out until the middle of July, unless somebody else gets, uh, like... Shout out to Erica. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, Ryan was, like, sitting out there, and I just put the headset down. I was like, hey, man, can you come in here for a minute? <laughs> and he had no idea what, what he was walking into. Oh, and gosh. I was like, why don't you sit... He brings his spreadsheets. Yeah, like, why don't you sit there on the end of the table and... Just so you know, we're going to be talking about our employee salaries and, and our promotion formulas. And he's like, what? <laughs> so it's not, it wasn't quite as easy as, as you getting to talk about websites. It's yeah. a little more sensitive topic. Um, <laughs> but anyways, we're, we're thrilled to have you here. And, you know, I'm sure we'll be bragging on you throughout this podcast. But um, Chelsea is definitely a, a breath of fresh air, not to imply that, you know, our air is stale here, but mm-hmm. that, you know, she's come in with incredible energy and, and background and and vision. And uh, for us, it, it took a while, you know, for us to get on, on this train. Um, so now that we are, I'm, I'm glad you're at the helm. I'm glad to be here. Awesome. Yeah. So for those that did have listened to recent episodes, they'll know we're getting in the, into websites, uh, but we have always been resistant as those close to us know, because we have wanted to only get into products if we feel we can really help push the industry forward. Um, and after, you know, years of deliberation, I'll say, and some like minor bullets at uh, for Jim Collins, we decided, hey, let's take a bigger bullet at this for websites. And then eventually, hopefully in 2023, shoot a cannon. Um, but Chelsea, the main reason to get you on in the early stages before you have it all figured out is to exactly get that, like you're transitioning between industries and then coming to us. And so it's a, it's hard sometimes to put yourself back where you were when you started in multifamily versus where you are six months from now. So why don't you just give us some like quick, you know, credentials, if you will, uh, <laughs> background on what you know, what your career has been up to this point and then, you know, what attracted you here and then we'll go from there. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, I'm as, as a kid, I was always very artistic. Um, so I, uh, you know, everybody kind of said graphic design is the way to be an artist and make money. So (laughs) that was kind (laughs) of just like the trajectory of my career from a very early age. I'd say probably like 12 or 13. 
I was super into books and magazines. So um, publication design was kind of a, a natural area that I moved into. Um, and so in my um, senior year of college, I started interning at um, a local agency. Uh, I guess not so local. I was in Shippensburg University and the agency was uh, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. So about 45 minute drive or so. Um, but, you know, my professors were kind of like, if you want like a legit design internship, this is the only place to go. And I was like, okay. <laughs> um, so, so I went there um, and I, you know, started out kind of helping with uh, a number of different things. There is some um, content management system updates, just kind of like basic content entry and then, um, you know, ads for magazines and then eventually layouts. Um, I uh, was hired full time after I graduated um, from school. And um, so magazines were kind of like my my baby. Um, and so eventually over time, I got more and more and I started leading the design there. And um, I really wanted to kind of uh, create an area of value for myself and also help the company um, with some different areas that they were struggling in. And so um, I had kind of identified web design and web development as an area that they were having a little bit of difficulty. They could have some improvement and also an area that I didn't have much experience in and that I knew would make me more valuable asset to any company and also, you know, for myself and my career trajectory. So I kind of brought this pitch to the VP and said, hey, you know, if you guys pay for me to learn web development, I'd love to help you guys, you know, figure out some ways to improve things. And so that was really the beginning of my, my foray into into web design, web development. Uh, that was in 2015, 2016. And um, from there, it was just kind of a, a series of, you know, working with um, senior developers and uh, management to improve uh, processes, efficiencies, um, help educate the, the company and um, make sure that people were more comfortable with web design and development processes. Um, I got a lot into emails and landing pages, those kinds of digital campaigns. And, um, you know, I was really, I was really excited when I found, um, I found, the opportunity at Digible, I honestly read that job description. I was like, this is, this is me. This is literally me. I had sent it to one of my best friends and I just didn't say anything. I just sent the job description and she texted me. She's just like, wait, this, this was written for you. I was like, I know I can't even, I can't even believe a job like this exists. And the benefits were, I mean, the four day work week thing, I was just like, wait, what is this real? So, you um, play the, you know, cha-ching or something. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Got to make sure we use that. For sure. I, I, I should have wah wahed myself <laughs> when I did the dinner. Right, <laughs> totally. <laughs> I forgot to introduce yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean, that was you know, I was I was looking I was looking for um, a place where I could I could get I don't know like. Uh, was it possible to get the full package basically? Like, could I get the culture that I wanted? The, the, you know, I've, I've always, my, my entire career was at this last company that I was talking about. So, um, you know, almost nine years of working with coworkers, I was really close with like family oriented kind of environment. And so I was like, well, I, you know, I can, there has to be a trade off somewhere. I'm either not going to have that or I'm going to have the benefits or I'm going to have the work that I love. It's, it seems like I couldn't get that. And, Digital, digital seems like the full package. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> It'll just start pointing at me whenever he needs to drop. Yeah. Well, uh, two things. Well, a couple things uh, actually. I have to go back for a second when you said in graphic design, uh, like from an early age. Reed, I don't know what did you go through the process when you were in like high school where they did like job placement mm -hmm. testing or something? Not really. I don't even know if graphic design. Like was a thing when I, <laughs> I mean, I'm the silverback well, this here is at where, this company, so this some I'm of going. this stuff did not even. Yeah, so I don't know if exist. I told you this before, but I so whenever there's something Reed hasn't heard from before, I'm like, well, now we got to tell the story. But uh, in high school, they had us take a job placement test, and it came back as my number one job fit was to be a, a sheep herder, <laughs> like to start ranching sheep. And I was like, I went to my guidance counselor. I was like, I don't even know, is this a joke? Like, what is this? And uh, so then I got very upset because I was like, I. I, I mean, I did love animals in the outdoors, but it's <laughs> like, how's it come back as sheep herder? So that it, was my number one job. Well, <laughs> that's not what I would, would, have, would have predicted, uh, you know, were you to do some sort of behavioral assessment. 
That being said, maybe yeah. it's fate that you and I are together because the, the first Wyckoff in America was a sheep herder. Get out of here. I <laughs> shit you not. <laughs> I can... I can verify that <laughs> with my mom. Yeah. But uh, yeah, every time we go over the genealogy chart, it's like, yep, there he is, yeah. Peter Wyckoff, the sheep herder. <laughs> like, so proud. <laughs> and now I know my, my business partner yeah. and co-founder yeah. is, was uh, predicted to be one. So mm -hmm. yeah. there you go. There he well, is, full circle. Yeah. But Where do we go from here? <laughs> I, uh, I did go to the library, and then I was like looking up books of like other things. Uh, this is the th like I, this is my point. I was in the library, mm -hmm. and there I pulled a book off the shelf, and it was like um, about computers or whatever. And it was like, okay, here's a job. You could be a web designer, and that's the one I was like, oh, okay, I lined the most up with. And it's funny because I was looking at you have no concept of like salary or whatever, but it was like at the time. So this must have been. 99 it was like the very best web designers in the world can pull in eighty five thousand a year and i was like hell yeah i'm gonna make it <laughs> and, and it's like yeah. at the time start like, ordering top shelf yeah and obviously like that's still a very fair living but i'm more i just this book was saying like the very top end it had the low end of like twenty eight thousand a year mm -hmm. and then it had to 85 and i was like well i think i could survive off of a you know somewhere <laughs> in that range of course, then I go to design websites. I was terrible. <laughs> I was awful. My buddy, uh, Chris, uh, actually was really talented. Um, and so I was like, okay, I guess this can't be me. Maybe it'll be him. Uh, well, it's harder. It's way harder than it seems. And I barely fumbled with it. But I, I think even today with all the, the technology, I guess, templates, if you will, um, there's still more, I think, art to it, I guess, and a design expertise that's needed than people recognize. Yeah. So with that being said, maybe that that's a decent uh, jumping off point, but what does make a great website, Chelsea, to you? Um, and if you want to steer this, if it's, if it's fair uh, towards multifamily, great, but um, maybe there's some kind of general things uh, that you can share with us about what makes a great website. Yeah. Um, I would say like first and foremost is, is user experience, you know, like as, as you have to put yourself in the user's shoes and be able to get what you need out of, out of a website. And I think that that's where a lot of people fall down. Um, and agencies can fall down also in particular, even if they have super talented designers, developers, like part of the issue is there's always satisfying the client, you know? And so the, the client has one perspective but a user has a whole other perspective and um, so sometimes it's difficult to get that in alignment and sometimes you know it's hard to kind of sell a client on hey I understand this is how you want it to be but you know here's what's going to be the best for your audience so I would say you know user experience needs to come first and I think you know, user interface, design, aesthetics, that's a close second, but ultimately you can have a good user experience without the best interface. I mean, Amazon is the perfect example of that, you know? <laughs> I like, it's like I coached you. You two have talked, else. yeah. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I don't think we've talked about this, no, have we? we? Haven't. No, I just <laughs> crap on Amazon's UX, but go ahead. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I'm like, like the number one Amazon user, I think, in the world, <laughs> or at least my wife is, and so... I, it's not that I take exception to David saying that because he, I know he's right, but it's just, I guess, proves your point, right? You <laughs> yeah. know, it's like we are power users, you know, and, uh, and the experience, I mean, the design aesthetics, all that stuff is, is not good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and it, you know, ultimately a, a well-designed website obviously is going to make you stand out, but if you go to use a well-designed website and you can't you know, get what you need out of it, then ultimately it, it's, it's a failure, you know, like it's not going to, it's not going to work for what you need it to do. So I think, um, that's where a lot of, a lot of people I think can tend to fall down. It's like, they're looking for something so unique and so outside of the box, something that's going to like really stand out from the crowd. But the problem with that is, you know, like there's a reason that there's a formula for websites these days. You know, there's, there's a reason that we use the hamburger menu and, you know, like little, little different things like that. If the hamburger menu isn't in the top, right, then you're going to be looking for it and you don't, you know, no, people aren't going to sit around and try and figure out a website. They're just going to go find a different one that they can navigate easily. So I think that's the the biggest thing is just like put, putting the user first, putting yourself in the user's shoes. Um, you know, if you have the budget for, for it, user testing, you know, like all that kind of stuff is ultimately going to lead to the best possible product. Yeah, well put. I think that's one of the bigger opportunities, I guess, uh, industry-wide is, is to understand the value of that user experience, the functionality, uh, 
I guess, and prioritizing it above the design because it is so hard and we understand it. It's not a surprise to me that most owners, you know, can't get over the design. It's like, I don't almost care about the functionality. It's like, this is the property that we're marketing. It has to look beautiful. Mm -hmm. But if it's put to them a little more the way you're describing, but almost more as a, as a business equation, you know, where it's like, well, if you were to have, you know, a higher conversion rate and you were to move some things around on the site so that it was a better user experience, you would actually see, you know, faster leasing velocity and ultimately better NOI. Mm -hmm. And it's like, so, you know, when you think in terms of which one really goes first or should be prioritized, if you can make it more of an economic equation, then I think, uh, you know, we might we might see more owners getting comfortable with uh, with that order of priority. Absolutely. Well, um, what makes you feel, like, do you think it was the right move in 2015, 2016 for you to start to go into websites? Or do you regret at all, like losing the print angle or the rest of the design? Uh, 100%, I think it was the right move. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change a thing. Um, there are definitely times where I miss the print aspect or I miss the amount of creativity. Um, you know, there's a whole wide range of things that you can do with, uh, you know, print design that you can't do with web, but vice versa, you know, you, there's a whole s bunch of stuff you can do with web that you can't do on print. Um, it gives me a lot of satisfaction to like watch something, you know, that I've kind of imagined statically in my mind, like come, come to life on a screen. Um, that was like one of the initial things that got me really into web design is, um, you know, animation, um, stuff like that, where it's just like, oh, I had, I had this object and now it's moving and now it's being added to a website in this way. And that was all just like really thrilling to me. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change a thing. I think it was the right move. I think that, um, in general, I have, I've got more of, uh, an ability to like, I don't know, uh, you know, basically talk the talk when it comes to technology and kind of like meet, meet in the middle in terms of like creatives and tech people and, you know, business people that I didn't realize that I really, I had, you know, obviously that didn't come immediately. It came with education and, um, time and experience, but, um, I didn't really realize that that was something that not everybody could do. And so I feel like that's a, a differentiator that I'm able to kind of, um, utilize and gives me more value. Cool. Well, for some background, your last agency had around 150 people all in. Mm -hmm. And then the digital arm was like 25 folks, but you were working on much larger projects, like websites that would be hundreds of pages. I would say usually less than 100. Okay. Um, but yeah, there were a few, a few that were over that 100 range. Yeah. And obviously now transitioning, but you've you know, sussed in the month <laughs> that you've been in multifamily. Tell us what your impression is from the outside and you don't have to pull punches, but you can, you know, where are they winning? Where are they losing? <laughs> uh, I would say, I would say one of the biggest areas that I was kind of, I'm kind of surprised that it's an issue is photography. Um, and that's also one of the like biggest suggestions that I would have for a lot of multifamily um, entities is like, you have to make the investment into photography of, you know, your, your property, um, properties, uh, because that like, that's what people are there for. Um, and so as, you know, as, as a person in web design, but then also as like a user who, you know, I came from Gettysburg, Pennsylvania to um, Denver, Colorado. So I went through the apartment um, search process and there were so many websites where it was like there were only renderings or only um you know blueprints of the layouts of the rooms and it's like the, well you know a, a virtual tour or a rendering can only do so much you know so it's important to have that that and that also adds to the aesthetics ultimately if you have good photography then like by you know uh you then have good design so i think that that's like one of the simplest things that you can do to like really get through to users and um you know put yourself in a more uh, a better position to be presented more professionally um i think another area that they're really falling down in 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 general is i mean something that i didn't really realize on the front end but something that we've discussed is just general accessibility for the actual property management companies like the fact that so many of these websites are like locked down and hard coded and you can't just get in to make simple text edits like that's just something that if you're if you're paying thousands of dollars for a website you should absolutely have the ability to make a change on that website um that's that's 
that was totally foreign to me. That was something that I had maybe experienced like once. Mm. Um, and so it's interesting that that's, I don't know, that happens so frequently in this industry. It's not a matter of like them not knowing how or not having, um, uh, you know, the ability or the desire to know how it's that they literally, they literally can't. Um, so it's, it's, that's very interesting. I think that's something that's super easy to solve. Um, something that I'm determined to, to solve, you know, I feel like you should absolutely be able to edit your own site. <laughs> yeah. Do you approve of her pronunciation? No, I don't. Wait, which pronunciation? <laughs> As aesthetics. <laughs> uh, I feel like everybody that, you know, within design and, and the creative side says aesthetics. I say aesthetics, and I believe I'm correct. Uh, so I knew instantly what Dave was talking about. I was trying to keep my mouth shut. But I was going to ask. There you was, took me there. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So the second thing you are going to we, go we can, too, but. we can get into that after the podcast, <laughs> Chelsea. <laughs> I have my pet peeves about certain words. Um, so somewhat, I guess, following up on this, but um, where do you think we are when it comes to the, the bridge? You know, how far apart is are we between, like, the designers and those that are focused more on the UX, the development? Because that seems to be always one of the biggest challenges is when designers get in, they, they don't, it's not even necessarily their fault, but they don't have the background per se. And so we see this in a lot of different areas of the creative world where, you know, the, the, the more creative design types versus the ones that are there for, for the technical or the editing, et cetera. And so I don't know, um, you know, between your education and your, your, your recent experience, if you feel like that bridge has, has gotten, you know, uh, narrower or if it's, it's still kind of where it's been over the last several years. And then uh, the follow-up to that is, you know, any, I guess, early thoughts about how you, you're planning to approach that. Um, is there the, the unicorn out there that, um, or more of them now existing that, that can think about both of those, mm -hmm. you know, um, and keep that vision, um, you know, I guess cohesive and compatible, or do you think it's still a real challenge in the industry between designer and, and actual technical development? So are you referring to like multifamily or like just like in general? You can, you can, I mean, you may not be there yet to, to comment on how big the problem is, right? In multifamily, but mm -hmm. You know, when David and I were interviewing some different firms talking about this, uh, that was coming up, you know, from from the from some of these agencies where it's like, this is this is still a struggle. Um, this is how we handle it or we're really effective at that. But it just to me seems to be kind of a recurring, I guess, conversation that, that we've gotten into, which. Yeah, so I just didn't know, like, maybe pre digital if that was a challenge, um, like getting designers, cause in, in our world, I'll just, I don't even know if this is going to be meaningful, but it's our operators and marketers, mm -hmm. you know, like trying to get them on the same page, you know, communicating. Um, and I didn't know if that, uh, well, yeah, if that's a fair comparison to the website world. Yeah. And uh, if you're like, Reed, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Like, <laughs> This doesn't make any sense. It's not an issue. That's totally fine too. <laughs> no, it's definitely, definitely an issue. 100%. Okay, good, good. Yeah. I'm glad I wasn't totally off base. I'm starting to get worried. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I would say that that's an industry and I don't, I think, or that's an issue in all industries, I would say. So like um, my background, the, the agency that I was at before, our, our primary pillars were healthcare, education, nonprofit, but we also had a number of different clients that fell outside those spheres. Um, and, uh, you know, here multifamily, you know, my experience at Digital, but also my experience as a renter looking for a place, um, I would say I, I had experienced across the board in all of these situations, the one-offs where it's like, oh, wow, this is, this is gorgeous and it's working and I'm able to find what I need to find and I'm able to do what I need to do. And this is awesome. And of course there were also tons of places that were awful and there were places in between, um, you know, uh, situations where the user experience was there, but, uh, you know, maybe the, um, the photography wasn't or the design in general wasn't, um, I, I feel like it's, it is a, it's a difficult balance to strike. And this kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about like satisfying the users and the client and, you know, the internal team, it can, it can be a tricky, tricky balance. Um, somebody ultimately is going to have something where they have to make a sacrifice and like, where is that going to be? Because ultimately that's going to affect performance. Um, so 
I'm not, I don't remember what was the second portion. It of was your just question, as, right? has it gotten better? Is it still where it's at? Because we feel like, and we'd like to think part of it is, is our own contribution, but that we're we're helping to start to bridge this gap mm -hmm. the, between operators and marketers, and uh, we expect that I'll say from you. And I think you know you mentioned that you've gotten much better, uh, more confident about talking the talk when it comes to the technical side. So I think. Ideally, you find people that can quarterback the, you know, a website build, you know, that that can live um, or see through both lenses, mm -hmm. um, and that's what you know. I know we're excited about with you, but I didn't know if it, you know, is still, and it sounds like it is. You know, one of the bigger challenges um, in getting a website, you know, from from the ground up, yeah. is getting the the you know the technical folks and the developers on the same page as the designers. And I don't know which one goes first. I don't know if we've ever talked about that or if you have opinions on that, where it's like, let the designer take the first pass and mm -hmm. show us something beautiful. Because I've been there too. I know you have, David, where it's like, that does happen. And then the, the, the technical, like the developer's like, good Lord, why didn't you check in with me sooner? You cannot do that, 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 and that. And so, um, but then sometimes it's harder for the designer to go second, even though maybe that is the right kind of order because they're like, well, you've got this great UX, but I can't create a beautiful design right. within, you know. So any opinions on the sequencing, I guess, or, or how to approach that? Yeah, so I think one in, one way where in general things have progressed in a positive direction is the amount of people that can kind of play hybrid roles. So you see a lot more designer developers or um, you know web designers that are well versed in front end development and then have a back end developer to kind of support them. And so um, you know, for for a while that was that was my role, um, and so I kind of bridged the gap between design and development, and I was serving that kind of dual role and that was able to kind of eliminate that problem because I could see both sides. I think honestly the sequencing kind of thing it's tricky in my opinion and this might be a cop out but like it just needs to be collaborative. I don't I don't think there should ever be a situation where the de designer runs off and creates something and then brings it to the developer and tells them to build it. Um, and you know honestly that was what was happening pretty frequently or if not all the time at my old agency before I kind of stepped in and was like, guys, this is, this is why, this is why we're not, we're not, uh, you know, uh, doing what we need to do here. Um, so I think, you know, it, what part of the process kind of, um, improvements that I brought to my old company was basically like frequent check-in meetings, you know, just being able to start off the process and, you know, sketch it out together and say, Hey, here's my vision. Here's the prioritization of content. Here are the different features and functions and interactivity that we need to keep in mind. And, you know, hey, designer, what are your, you know, out there ideas? You know, is there something outside the box that you're trying to do that we need to discuss? And, you know, having those frequent check-ins uh, allows you to kind of be creative, but also understand, you know, where you need to draw, draw the line with scope and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, uh, getting back to uh, multifamily websites, you had said images were like a major pain point. What mm -hmm. else do you have as like a pet peeve when, you, you know, back through your own journey and what you've just, you know, started to scope in this first month? Well, she can't already have been forming pet peeves about multifamily websites, can she? <laughs> I mean, I, I think so. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's possible. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, you'd be surprised. <laughs> um, so I think one of the, one of the biggest things that um, you and I touched on briefly in one of our meetings recently, David, um, the ability to, you know, see, okay, what, what apartments are available and all right, let's say I'm looking for um, two bedroom apartments and there are eight of them available in this complex. I want to know where they are. Like, I'm not going to go and apply to this one specific apartment without knowing where it is, like what, like there are different price points there for like all that. So I was seeing this really frequently where it's like, oh, we've got three, we've got five, we've got 10. And then they would make you choose which one you wanted to apply for. And it's like, well, how can I possibly choose that if I don't know where it's situated? Like what, what floor is it on? You know, like there were some websites that didn't even have that available. So the websites that had those kind of like interactive maps where if you mm -hmm. click on the apartment, it like takes you to it and it shows you, oh, like this one is fake the lake and it's on the first floor and you know like that's that's vital I think um, you can definitely get by without it but um, it's it's very very helpful for a user um, I would say in general up-to-date availability information too because this was a huge huge pain point for me I would um, book 
tours and I had specifically booked a trip. I came out for three days just to apartment hunt. And um, there were at least, I think, four places that I had showed up and I had just booked the tour like a day or two prior. And either it wasn't available at the time that I booked it, but I was able to, or in those day or two spans, it had gotten swiped up and there was like no notification process. So that was definitely, that was definitely frustrating. Um, but I also know, you know, uh, PMS integration into, into websites and having that kind of real time updates can be a pain point, but I would love to see that kind of issue get resolved, um, you know, either through third party or someday through digital, you know, that's definitely something from the user perspective. And I mean, ultimately I think the, the property perspective that it, it has to get fixed. Did you do the virtual tours or did you book online? Like, what was your experience? Did you apply online to any ahead of time? Like, I, I know when you were here, you had like 11 tours or something scheduled. So how did you, at, at, did, was there some point that you eventually said, okay, I'm just going to apply or, you know, tell mm -hmm. us about that process. Uh, I had 20 tours. <laughs> oh, jeez. I, I went hard. Oh, no. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, it was a very busy two days. Um, but um, wow. so uh, I... I did do some virtual tours, some video tours online. Um, and uh, for, for a bit, I was kind of thinking like, all right, maybe I can, maybe I can get by with not going out there. Like maybe this will work. But when I started having like more options that I was like happy with and like, oh yeah, I could see myself here. Like as that list grew, I was like, no, I, I need to be there. I need to be in person. Um, so I booked all of the tours online, you know, scheduled the, the options options there. Um, I also worked with, oh, I forget what they're called. Um, you know, one of those, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, a broker who he had set me up with, I think, um, four tours. So I kind of went off of, you know, I, I had, I was starting day one. It was like all me all on my own day two. It was like half the day was with him. And then the rest of the day was on my own. Um, when I got out here, uh, the, f the first day was super, super disappointing. That was the day where the most places I had shown up and they were just like, we have nothing for you. Um, <laughs> so that was really, really discouraging. Terrible. Yeah. Um, now, luckily, towards towards the afternoon on that day, um, I'd gone to a Gray Star um, property that uh, the, you know, the property manager, whoever it was that I was interacting with um she yeah. basically felt really bad she was like i'm so sorry because that was like the third or fourth place i'd been there and they were like we can't show you anything she had said the same thing and she was like well hold on let me let me take a look for you here in you know gray stars database and had pulled up a couple additional places that i hadn't had on my list um that then i went and checked out and a few of those were really promising so um I didn't apply to any of the places until the end of the second day. And then it was kind of like a mad dash. And I applied to three places all at once because I couldn't decide. Um, and I wanted to like scope out the neighborhoods a little bit more around those apartments. So I, um, you know, most of the places were offering like, okay, you do like $150, $200 deposit, but it's fully refundable if you don't end up getting it. And you've got like 48 hours to make a decision. So I just like, at the end of day two, I applied to all three places. And then the third day that I was there, I basically just went and drove around and like asked people in the complexes, like, what's it like living here? And went around in town and talked to small business owners and that kind of stuff. So freaking remarkable, <laughs> yeah. like so thorough, like that you would be the ultimate testimonial, like, <laughs> right? I mean, if I'm the apartment that she chose, yeah. it'd be like... <laughs> this person viewed 20. Went through 20, <laughs> yeah, days, a broker, you know, you know yeah. yeah, applied. I mean, it's, I applaud, <laughs> I'm, I can't imagine, it sounds so exhausting, but <laughs> now I want to know very much where you live. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was I going to ask? Oh, yeah. Um, so in the process, did you ever interact with uh, any of the the virtual leasing uh bots, you know, like the, the widgets, like David and I, I don't know if he was going to go there before or get there. Um, but that's one of the bigger trends in multifamily websites, mm -hmm. you know, as operators are trying to find ways to be more efficient, it's like, well, can't we intercept a lot of some of these like early leads or soft leads with, you know, a chat bot and potentially get a lot of those questions answered up front so that people that do finally get to us are further down in the funnel, um, in a higher quality 
So just curious, uh, a, you know, more from a renter, um, you know, uh, how that, you know, strikes you, uh, and then B from a website standpoint, do you think that that, I don't want to call it necessary evil, but it's a good thing, a good experience can be, and will be, you know, better and better as we get further, further into it. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I personally did not do that at all throughout my process. But I do think that if I if I had made the decision to not come out here and see places in person, I absolutely would have. Like I would have had a number of questions and it I would have needed to. Um, so I, I do kind of view it as necessary unless you have, you know, the staffing capacity to be able to answer people like with actual humans. I feel like most places don't. Um, so I do kind of think it's probably a necessary evil and it's definitely going to be helpful from a user perspective, especially for people who are doing, you know, long distance moves. Yeah. How was your, so with the 20 that you set up, I know four of them or so were from the broker. Did you like get all the information you needed about questions ahead of time? Or did you just say, hey, once I'm there, I'm going to have a human and I'm just going to ask on site, but I want to tour it. So it almost sounds like what was your order of priority of like what you were looking for? Mm -hmm. And is that why you didn't ask questions ahead of time? <laughs> um, so with the, with the broker, um, like most of my uh, priorities had already been discussed in our initial call. So he kind of asked, you know, like, okay, what, what exactly are you looking for? And like, what are your you know, non-negotiables and then what are your like nice to haves. So he pretty much already had that, all that information. I think honestly, I also didn't really think about all of the questions that I needed to ask until I was there and he was asking some of them or, um, you know, some of the people that were giving me a tour would bring something up. And I was like, oh, I didn't even think to ask of that. Um, like one of the things that ended up being important to me that I didn't have on my initial list of priorities was bike storage. I didn't really think that that was going to be a problem here. But out of the 20 places that I toured, only one place offered bike storage. So everywhere else it was like you, you know, they, they might not even have like bike racks. Like there were only one or two complexes that had racks. So it's just like, you just carry it up the stairs and put it mm -hmm. on your deck if you have a deck um, or a balcony. Um, but so, um, oh gosh, what was your original question here? Just order the, of priorities and then why you didn't ask questions ahead of time. Yeah. So it was kind of like partially most of the, my high priority questions were already answered by like, you know, descriptions on the website um, or the, you know, the broker that I've been talking to um, and like what that order of priority was like my pretty much like top priority was to have like a little bit of additional space so that I could have a studio um, or at least like have uh, like a creative workspace. So um, I, you know, I, I do some DIY projects. I'm um, a crafter. So uh, it was really important to me that I would have a space that I could do that. So a few of the like one bedrooms that I had checked out, it was like they were large enough that I could do that, you know, in a corner of the living room where they had like, you know, one of those like little den areas or a little nook with a desk. And it's like, okay, this would suffice. Um, and then others were, you know, two bedrooms where like, obviously I would have the space. That was probably priority number one. Priority number two was definitely like having um, like either walking paths or a walkable safe neighborhood um, ideally something with like some kind of nature I did not want to be in the city um, so that obviously having a little bit more space is obviously a lot easier outside of the city so those kind of those two kind of went hand in hand um, and those were like my hardest hitting items everything else was kind of just like a bonus other than a dishwasher I haven't had a dishwasher and I was like I need one <laughs> <laughs> so uh, first, you don't want to shout out your Etsy store. Can you take your <laughs> orders from our audience? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yep. I I do um, handmade um, greeting cards. Uh, uh, Chelsea Solutions on Etsy. Also <laughs> ChelseaSolutions.com. Thank you very much for the opportunity for that plug, David. <laughs> yeah. Well, I love it. You sent us one. You overnighted us one. Sent like, you yeah. one. After. Sent you one. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> you didn't get one. I won't ever but let that she, go. <laughs> she did have to though call me or something. You like sent me a text or something. You were like, "Did you check the mail?" Question mark. <laughs> Because <laughs> it must have really been like, how did yeah, I mean, this should have gotten the reaction? What, uh, but we don't check the mail. Really. It was amazing. It yeah. was incredible. So I f fully support Chelsea's like, um, yeah, venture there. Uh, <laughs> great skill set. Yeah. So what um, you mentioned website descriptions? How did the con I wasn't surprised that you got value out of the website descriptions because mm -hmm. the websites I've been on they all feel basically the same. So 
as a renter, was that actually your experience that you were getting good value from there? Or was there, and I'm not trying to lead you, it's just, is there opportunity for low effort, high reward now that, since it's so recent for you going through the renter experience? Yeah, yeah. So I would say in general, for the most part, I was either able to get the information that I needed from the ILS um, or from the actual property website, um, at least the hard hitting kind of things that I was looking for. So like, you know, do they accept pets? If they do accept pets, like what are the fees? Um, you know, is there a fitness center? Like all those kinds of things are like, those are like my highest priority items that like, yes, I was able to easily check those boxes. Um, some of the, you know, more specific kind of things. Again, I had mentioned like I just wasn't really thinking fully about everything that I would need to know until I was there. Um, so, you know, the bike storage thing. Um, one of the things also in retrospect that I don't think I realized until now being a resident somewhere for a month now is like it would have been really nice to know like what's communication like here? You know, like how do you submit a maintenance request? And like is there a newsletter? You know, am I going to know when the pool is open or what are the business center hours? just like little things that, um, you know, where I'm living right now, they don't have good communication. And so it's like, I feel like I have to just send everything in an email. And anytime I go into the office, they just write things on post-its. And I'm just like, this is not a reliable system, guys. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's where... There goes that testimonial. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, we're we're going to like, yeah, edit it. You know, yeah. Dot, 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 before. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, w I was going to go there on the, on the renter experience cause, uh, it's big in the space, in the prop tech space for pe people to work on the resident experience now. So it's better. Mm -hmm. Um, but let's stick with the customer experience at yeah. first. So, uh, how about the, um, communication as you like had booked a tour? Like, did you, were you getting drip emails before, after, like, was there any foul up where you kept getting them for too long or you couldn't get out or just curious how that felt? Yeah. Um, yeah. There were, there were only like one or two places where it was like I had, um, you know, I had canceled the tour and I mean, I guess this is, this is probably a, a good email marketing campaign. Like I canceled a tour, but they kept asking me to reschedule. So I don't know if that would really be a follow up, but, mm -hmm. um, uh, for the most part, I would say no, it like mostly they were all good. There were a few places that didn't confirm like that I had scheduled an appointment. And so that was a little, um, just very thorough. So that was a little anxiety inducing. So I would like email them and be like, Hey, I scheduled a tour. Is this actually on the books? Um, but I would say for the most part, no, it was, it was all pretty thorough, pretty, um, pretty good all around. There were um, mostly I would say, here's, here's one thing. If I needed to reschedule the tour, there were a couple places where I couldn't do that in like vir virtually digitally. I couldn't do that just like quickly by clicking on a button. I had to like call them or email them. That was kind of annoying because I was figuring out so many things at the time. So that was just another thing to add to my to-do list. But, um, I would say in general, most of the places were really smooth. And the communication like the pre-sale email was that good or not good or how many of them actually had let's say pre-sale email campaigns that were targeting you after you signed up um i would say the vast majority probably like 80 to 90 percent in terms wow. of like quality of information i mean that varied pretty widely and it was also like not something that i was spending a lot of time reading or analyzing it was mm -hmm. kind of like i booked the tour i'm going to see the place in person mm -hmm. i don't really care what they say in this email because it, i'm going to make my decision when i'm there so i would say there were there were a few emails that i got that um weren't responsive and that bothered me just as a web designer so i'd open on my email and i would have to like zoom into it and that was bothersome but the actual content itself honestly i don't i don't remember too much <laughs> Well, that's great. This is super helpful. Well, yeah, go ahead. Well, um, I'm curious. One of the areas we've identified, um, you've already heard this, but I'll, I'll say it anyways, um, is is more content or more relevant content. So I was glad to hear that, you, you know, you got some value, um, maybe I'll be at a marginal, I don't know, uh, from the website content. But uh, Dave and I were just talking about this as we were uh, – revisiting i guess um some some of our ideas about if we were to build an ils um and so there's a connection here with like this the, the content angle like we don't see that 
and with ILSs, you know, they don't put a huge focus there, uh, almost the way maybe an Airbnb does, as David often brings up, and we don't see that really on websites. But um, if you hear a lot of, uh, I'll say, students of multifamily and the process of, of locating an apartment, it doesn't begin with the apartment. It actually begins with neighborhoods or, you know, what's around, like deciding or being able to determine, especially in relocation, you know, what's an area that I would be comfortable living. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the next step is, okay, now I'm going to start really getting serious about different uh, um, yeah, buildings that I might want to do a tour. So if you agree with that, um, do you think it's uh, too aspirational um, or or not um, to start introducing more, I'll say, neighborhood content, um, resourceful content, um, you know, on site mm. or through an ILS? Or do you think that it needs to stay and will stay as it is, which is getting on Google and searching and learning about Denver or learning about Littleton or wherever you're, you're going to end up? Um, living. Mm -hmm. So yeah, how, how do you feel about um, that notion of, of more content? Yeah, I would say like 100% that's necessary. And the whole neighborhood aspect and your, um, you know, what you mentioned about looking for a neighborhood first and then an apartment, like absolutely, that was, you know, my strategy. And one of the first questions I had asked David was just like, hey, this is kind of what I'm looking for. Like, you know, what areas would you recommend looking in? Um, and so from there, then, you know, ultimately, eventually I found um, complexes. And I like the way that I started my search was mostly, okay, where where, where the towns, where the neighborhoods that I like. And then it was the ILS would kind of give me an initial list. And then I would go to those websites. And there were a lot of times that the ILS provided me information or content that the website did not. So for example, like I loved the walkability score mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, the neighborhood like safety ratings. And, um, you know, th there were some, t there were a couple situations where like there was pet policy information on the ILS, but it wasn't on the website. I'm like, guys like <laughs> what the heck so there are there are definitely some situations where it's like the ILS is giving me more information than the website so I'd have to use them together um but then there were also those those few scenarios where it's like the ILS gave me that initial kind of lead I went to the website and the website kind of sold me um I would say that was that was a lot more rare though um so uh in terms of you know being able to uh get into that sphere and um uh, what, what were you saying was too ambitious the the idea of well bringing more of that content or uh aspirational and thinking that you know you would be able to i guess intercept or provide some of the value that typically lives outside of the website mm -hmm. related to like neighborhood research and stuff so i wouldn't expect you know those trends to to change as far as people thinking first like i'm gonna talk to somebody or Google or whatever, and that that's going to start that process. And so where or how could a website then actually, you know, present any content, right? Yeah. It's like, um, but what it seems like is you can really complement or better sell your community if you lean into that. So David and I uh, worked with, and we still are working with Prometheus out there on the West Coast, but just tipping my cap to them, uh, it struck David and I when we first met with the marketing director, VP uh, Amy um, Marshall, but... She said, just so you know, we refer to our properties as communities, not mm -hmm. as properties. And the reason is, is that you know, we're really trying to emphasize the broader community, not just the one that exists at the in the building. And they're in a great position because they're in Mountain View and some really desirable areas. But it's like the retail, you know, you mm -hmm. know, um, uh, you know, climate around there, uh, you know, bars, restaurants, whatever it is. Right. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that, you know, we're thinking in terms of a broader community. I don't know if their websites, uh, and we don't have to say more than we need to, you know, but if they back that up, yeah. but they should, mm -hmm. in my opinion. It's like, if that's an advantage, then shouldn't you lean into that content on your website instead of falling, I don't want to say victim, but uh, to, you know, the templates that pretty much dominate right now multifamily websites, yeah. which don't don't really include a ton of content around the broader community. For sure. No, I think that that's, uh, honestly, I think it's essential. I, I think that because there's such a focus and such a priority on 
that community aspect on the neighborhood, um, they are doing themselves a disservice when they don't include that information. Um, and there are like little things where like even even some of the places that did do a really good job of communicating, you know, amenities and the community oriented kind of feel. You know, there was one place in Sloan's Lake that um, it was one of my final three that I had applied to. And it was a much, much smaller apartment than I wanted. But because of that kind of community orientation, because of all of the the retail and the nature in that area, it was like a, a hard uh, um, a hard hitting area for me from the very beginning before I even saw it in person. But then when I saw it in person, they were telling me about how like there's a farmer's market and they like closed down that strip and it's literally right outside your door. And I'm like, why wasn't that on your website? Like mm. that's, that's a selling point. That's something that will get you to the top of somebody's list. And it's really important to include that content. And I don't think it's that maybe I'm oversimplifying here, but I don't think it's that heavy of a lift to get that content together, you know? Yeah. Com well, compared with the ROI. <clears throat> why were you uh, viewing both? Like if you found these on the ILS, why go to the website? Uh, just to see if there was any additional information. Like I said, just thorough. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm just curious. I mean, because it's kind of what you're saying is it's like as a user, you're using both. And so mm -hmm. then as a product person, it's more of how do we make you only need one of them? Mm -hmm. Is it more that the ILS could be better to Reed's point if it had all of this neighborhood information and it can say, hey, there's basically 10 properties that meet your neighborhood criteria and so choose from one of those or is it more of it's going to be a better experience always if you get to the website and then they can talk about the farmer's market that an ILS isn't going to pick up yeah or at some point do you actually still need, are you always going to end up having both because you need one that's a resource that has everything because you don't google's not doing it for you mm -hmm. right then you have the other where you're like okay i feel like the, this should be the source of truth right right is the website I think the biggest thing for me that I liked about the ILS was what Reed hit on earlier, which was the map. So I can put in my, you know, my priorities and then I can see a map of like, these are all of the different areas that meet your criteria. And then I would use that list to then go check out the website. So I would kind of filter, it was like that initial filter of like, okay, here are the places that meet my criteria. Then I would kind of look through the list and see like any additional details about those places. And then I would use that information to then go go search and see, you know, what else can I find out about this place? What are the Google reviews? Um, you know, I was definitely like, I would look at the reviews on the ILSs, but I was trusting Google a lot more. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. really valid, but that was where I was weighing, <laughs> weighing things. Um, so, so yeah, the, I would say uh, I definitely was util utilizing both and I think it'll take a lot of work and like somebody to be super innovative in terms of creating that kind of like neighborhood search kind of situation to ever get to a point where you wouldn't need an ILS. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great feedback. Yeah. So on uh, the operational side, uh, is there, are there things that they could be doing on the website or in the customer journey to make it more efficient? Like both, I guess for them, the opera, the, meaning the property management companies and for the user. Because you had mentioned through your whole journey about needing to go to 20 places and not always being updated. Like, I don't know if a human can really be there to answer these chats. Is there just something where I guess all of us inside the industry are missing and that you, I don't know, that you noticed on your journey? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I might need to think a little bit more about that, but I will say right off the bat, like what I had mentioned earlier, I do think if there would be a way to automate, you know, a, a process in terms of like notifying people like, hey, you scheduled a tour for a one bedroom apartment on Monday and, you know, it's Thursday and all of our one bedrooms have been booked and we don't have anything available until August and mm -hmm. it's June, you know, like that kind of information would have been super, super helpful for me. Now, granted, that doesn't really help, you know, them sell more places, but it does give you kind of like a better, a better taste of like, oh, okay, they acknowledge that I'm a human and that my time is valuable and that I don't want to waste my time driving there just for somebody to tell me something that could have been communicated earlier. That being said, I also understand like things happen very quickly and I'm not sure how possible something like that is, but. No, it makes sense. I mean, uh, my argument, you know, was going to be, Hey, I, if I can get you in the door, maybe I could sell you a two bedroom. Hmm. But, um, you also mentioned earlier how you recognized a gray star building and how helpful that person was for mm -hmm. you and gave you others. So, did you start clicking on like, hey, this management company, that management company, or did it was it still not a like something that you really paid attention to ahead of time of going to or something? 
that honestly wasn't really something that I paid attention to until, well, Graystar honestly was the only like name that was familiar to me at all in terms of, uh, um, the industry. Um, and you know, then that, that recognition or familiarity was just reinforced when you had like name dropped them a few times during the interview process. Um, and then again, when that, you know, uh, that employee was super helpful and helped me find some additional gray star, uh, places that again, super, super helpful. Um, so not really, uh, outside of gray star, honestly. Um, but, uh, that was a topic of conversation that I had had with the broker that I worked with where like he had kind of given me just a general kind of idea of like, okay, well, this place is managed by these people and, you know, they're kind of hit or miss. It depends on the community. It depends on the property. And um, there were a few places that I had on my list that I was viewing after the tours with him. And so I had kind of asked him like, hey, do you know this property? You know, what do you know about this management company? And so that was kind of a conversation then. But I would say in the initial search and in the initial touring process before the end of that second day, it wasn't really on my radar yeah and before any of the audience leaps out at me for quote miss teaching you or whatever uh they will call it a broker and then some people will also call it a locator so just so you know from a vocab it's kind Got of it. interchangeable for many folks but uh, <laughs> it just kind of depends on region um all right so i do have one thing that reed always asks and i'm surprised he didn't get there yet you know what well no i i don't but maybe if i thought <laughs> More come than on, a half second, got... I'd come up with it. I, I was going to uh, squeeze in since we've had more and more of the, uh, our podcast directed towards single family. Mm. If I could ask if that was even a, uh, any consideration there, Chelsea, where, or is it just, um, well, yeah, I don't want to lead you, but yeah. did you even consider single family? For sure. So I lived in a single family unit for the past six years and I loved it. Um, and yeah, that was definitely, um, a consideration at first. It was like, is that even possible? Would I even be able to afford that in this area? Are there even enough available? Um, and I think I had discussed this with you briefly, David, but it was very much like very, very hard to come by or hard to find. Um, so I think Facebook marketplace was the only place where I was able to find like any single family units. And in most cases, Facebook, marketplace was like they already had a whole bunch of people that were interested a whole bunch of people that were touring and they were asking if I could show up like that day or the next day and it was like no I'm in I'm in Pennsylvania um there were two people who offered to do like FaceTime tours um or to send me videos um I did take one of those people up on that offer um but yeah it was definitely a consideration there was really only one place that kind of fit my budget budget fit my criteria that I had kind of strongly considered. Um, and the issue there was the move in date. It was just like way too, way too far out for what I needed. So by process of elimination, it kind of, but it sounds like if the inventory was there, like yeah. you, you would have leaned that, that direction, which is super interesting. Uh, Cause I, I make maybe a unfair assumption that, um, whether it's amenities or whether it's safety or whether it's having a built-in community that, you know, that, that, um, well, th those benefits uh, is what drives, you know, somebody in your position to go to multifamily or think multifamily first. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't sound like that was the case. It was more like, you know, it was just a matter of what was available and at what cost. Mm -hmm. So, uh, which is, you know, I think, a, I don't know if it's a good sign per se, but I think it, it's, it's exciting, you know, that, um, you know, some of those maybe assumptions or at least for me, you know, aren't holding true anymore and that more people are open or looking for single family rental, which I think is going to be important as inventory does um, on more the, the, uh, the owner side uh, starts to really get constricted. Then it's, you're going to see, I think more and more people that are renting out their places, mm -hmm. um, which will then open up the inventory and could be a pretty, pretty big change um, for multifamily. Uh, is it, is it? <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. Well, I, I had prepped her for this, but then you took us down this massive resident experience, well, which I I geek out on. And I knew you were. I thought you were going to want to jump on yeah. journey. No, no, I love it. I I I think I told you that. I was like, I want you to map out your whole experience so we can talk about it. I didn't know it'd be on the podcast, but it's supposed to be about websites. So David's somewhat bringing us back, and um, you'll let me ask this. Yeah. Okay. So past, present, future. It's one of the 
are my favorite things to ask of, you know, people that are experts in, in their given you know, space. Mm-hmm. And so um, I don't know if this helps, but when you think about, you know, biggest changes, I guess, with websites in the past, mm-hmm. maybe most people would bring up mobile, you know, still is at the top of that list. And that's probably fair. But anything else to add, like as far as kind of big changes uh, as, as you think about the last few years for websites and then where we sit today, just uh, what the climate is, where the focus is. And I think you've gotten at a good amount of that kind of at the front of it. Um, but yeah, if you have any ideas and certainly some of it's shaped by the industry, but you know, what's ahead for websites. Um, so I'll let you take it from there, but why don't you start with the past, like anything other than mobile that you'd be like, yeah, this was a big deal. Yeah. Um, I would say, I mean, in general, you know, I don't know, early, early nineties, you know, when websites first became a thing, it was like all all the focus was on copy. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, now you can add images. And then, you know, eventually we got to a place where there could, you know, really be some design, but it was very much, you know, the, the tables, you know, it was just, you know, what can you fit in these blocks? And so I'd say one of the biggest changes I've just seen over, you know, from when I initially got into websites 2015-16 to now is the expansion of design elements and the ability to get more organic with shapes and um, you know not just stick to those those block elements um, so uh, design and aesthetics in general has come a long way trackability obviously too um, and you know like you were saying mobile of course um, the the focus on user experience I think in terms of where we are now and where we're headed in the future I think a lot of there's so many tools now where it's like you don't have to be a developer to build your own website and that kind of accessibility is going to be essential for the future and it's already becoming so prominent you know so many people are not willing to pay tens of thousands of dollars to create a website they want to hire someone for a smaller budget or they want to do it themselves um so that's only going to become more and more prominent. Um, I think that accessibility also in terms of, you know, ADA, you know, like being able to uh, have your website work for somebody who may have some kind of a disability. That's something that's becoming more important now that will be even more important in the future. Um, it's definitely not something that everybody's thinking about or everybody's even aware of. And I think that's definitely going to change. I think, um, you know, we, we hit on this in the interview process, but also the ability to, um, you know, automate a web, web website processes. So we're already seeing this with, you know, CSV imports, exports with, um, you know, blog posts and um, products for e-commerce websites, all that kind of stuff, like the ability to mass import content into a website and have that auto generate and take a lot of the manual, you know, legwork out. That's absolutely going to become more prominent and, um, you know, ultimately going to help people again to create their own websites. So I think the, the future, the future is bright. I'm very interested to see how things change. And um, obviously we've come a long way. Oh, that's good. I very, mean, like, very, I love, very strong. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm surprised. I feel like no one's been as smooth on the like past, present, future question. Yeah, I like the way she was, you know, focusing using prominent. It's like this is going to become more prominent. Yeah. You know, that doesn't take us, which I'm not asking for 10, 15 years out. <laughs> I was going to push it's, there next. It's out. more <laughs> <laughs> the next few years, uh, which is where we probably need to keep our focus and keep this conversation. But yeah. you know. I, I was going to ask about cost, so you touched on that, um, so I appreciate that. But um, you know, the 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 cost of a website five ten years ago, re- relative, you know, to um, you know, I guess industry, and then you know, how how big, how robust is the website? How much that's changed? So I'm trying to make this. I'll I'll say like big screen TVs. You know, they're so much more affordable now, right? Um, and yet I still hear staggering numbers, especially multifamily, on what people are paying for websites. When you really unpack it, it's more that they're paying for the branding package. And then, you know, uh, they just bake in kind of the, the ongoing maintenance or development fees. So I don't know if that, uh, to you, like, makes sense um, as you talk about kind of the future of you know, more do it yourself and more accessibility and affordability with websites, but any comments or maybe a little bit more on, you know, what we should expect, what do you think makes sense from a a cost model structure? Yeah. I mean, um, I, I definitely see things 
being forced to, to be more affordable because as we discussed, it's now a lot, you have so many different tools out there where you can just do it yourself. And so where before it used to be kind of justified because it was absolutely a specialized field and, you know, only a certain kind of professional could do this kind of work. That's really not the case anymore. Um, and I think, you know, for every agency where you have to pay, you know, 50, 60, $70,000 for a website or upwards of that, obviously, Obviously, there's also going to be like, you know, some contract worker or freelancer that's going to do it for a fraction of the price. And so um, the more the more resources that you have to be able to do something affordably, obviously, the more that's going to drive costs down. So I definitely think the trajectory there is going to move downward. And I don't really know what that means for agencies, but there's definitely going to have to be a shift there. Cool. And how important do you think it is, and now I'm going to say specifically for Digital and, and for your vision, for us to include the the creative, I guess, end of this, like mm -hmm. offering? Um, you know, we're not starting that way openly, and, and the clients we've already kind of teed up or talked to understand that. But um, do you think that's kind of an essential part of our roadmap, or do you think we, we can stay on just more the, the development side and kind of post-brand post mm -hmm. uh, creation? So, yeah, what's your take there? That's a good question. And honestly, I haven't really decided where I'm going to land on that. Um, I think that there's always going to be creative aspects of websites where like you're going to have to have, you know, certain programs or certain skills where you're going to need to, you know, uh, bang out something super quickly. Oh, this company gave me a logo that's a JPEG with a background. I, I'm going to need to you know, remove that background, get something high resolution, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, Photoshopping, all that, the kind of basics, but then there's like actual, you know, brand creation. I, I definitely think that there's, there's a place where you don't have to go that far down the rabbit hole. Um, but I also think, you know, is that something that would fit within, you know, Digible's mission, long-term vision? I'm not really sure. I feel like we have to hash that out together, but I think that there, there are pros and cons to both approaches and, um, uh, coming from a company that had, you know, a uh, solid creative services. It's definitely been an interesting adjustment not having that. And I'm intrigued to see where I land, um, you know, in the future, if it's, you know, we determine that it's something that's absolutely essential or we determine, Hey, it's, it's okay for us to partner with somebody to get these kinds of, um, you know, boxes checked. Yeah. I mean, uh David and I, not to speak for you, but I think this is one of our shared, uh, I guess, hesitancies or, or concerns about going down this path was just how personal websites are, you know, to, to the people that are investing in them. And understandably so, um, but so much of that is pointed at the creative. And so by not immediately, I'll say, adopting that, you know, we're... we're one step removed from that. But then there's also the advantage between, you know, higher ticket, right? As we said, like a lot of the money is spent up front on that. And then I don't know if there's any more stickiness if you've created the brand and then also then ultimately, you know, take it to market and build the website. But um, yeah, I that's what makes me nervous when I think about creative is, you know, the scope creep and just the back and forth. It's like, I paid you $50,000 for this and then you're beholden to them um, you know, for, for months, sometimes, you know, more, more than a year. And it's like, really what we want to focus on is, is the functionality, you know, the conversions. And obviously we need to like pull this together so that it represents your brand well, but, um, obviously more to come on that. Like you said, there's, there's the pros and cons, but, um, uh, you just have my wheels turning when it, when you were mentioning the content and the updates and things like that, because we certainly have talked about dynamic content with a lot of the NLG we've done, but it, I had never struck me before, even though we, we talk about this with Google posts and how we can automate that process. But think of the human hours lost, like the lifetime mm -hmm. of human hours. Like they talk about the spreadsheet being invented and how that put all these people out of work. And it was like, great. Think of all those human hours we saved in a way. <laughs> right. But now it used to be like read when we were at the yellow pages where it was like, well, you set your ad, your double truck for the year or whatever. Right. And you don't touch it again. And next year it's like, no, we're good. Maybe a new tracking number just to see what, how, you know, right. 96. Put the number 95. in red. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, man, if you think about how you, you really, you can't leave your website for a year like you could your mm -hmm. yellow page ad. And yet that's what happens, I'll say, in apartments. But I'm, I'm th moving outside of apartments for a second and just thinking, like, even the digital website is so out of date, we know, on, on so many things. 
and there's just lifetimes you. being How lost there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Websites are living, breathing entities that always need to be updated. You can never just create a website and set it and forget it. That's just not a thing. So, yeah, for sure. Uh, it, there's... it is a multifamily, Chelsea. <laughs> <laughs> and digital. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm hurt. I'm offended. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just love that that idea of like, and I know we're not going to go there today. I guess we'll go there maybe six months from now with her. But like, what <laughs> does websites look like in ten years? Because uh, with the automation, what is possible? Could you get to a point where you do turn it on and you leave it? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm. I, I think we can also have a part two and talk. You know, I hope very openly about some of the bullets and the cannons within for Chelsea. It's like, you know, what, what do you want to take some risks on? You know, I, I appreciate what you're saying as far as some of the people trying to, to shake things up and then actually it backfiring as far as some of those gambles, I guess, and, and how they're trying to do a site map or the design that they might put forward. There's a great frontline special that I often, I guess, quote, but they said so many people that are trying to break through the clutter are, are just contributing to the clutter. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that that's a great lesson and something that, that we should be thinking about. But at the same time, as David's pointed out, and you know this and you're totally supportive of it, is we want to find ways to innovate. And so it'll be really fun as, as you do get, uh, you know, your bearings and spend more in time in this industry on, on where you want to innovate, where you think the biggest opportunities lie so that, yeah, we're not just contributing to the clutter, you know. Absolutely. Cool. cool. Well, Chelsea, anything before we get out of here? I don't think so. Thanks for having me. Cool. Thanks for being on. Chelsea Absolutely. Solutions, if you want that greeting card. <laughs> Thank I'm you. telling you, she, did, she the one that she did for David, just so our listeners are not in the dark, yeah. um, uh, had uh, Lucy, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, your French... Uh, French Bulldog. French Bulldog. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And it was like spot on. Mm -hmm. It was really amazing. Was there something... There was more to it, though. It wasn't just Lucy. Well, she had the... the uh, not what is it called? What's it? Beret. beret. Yeah, yeah and beret it said mer merci. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah, and she wrote like two pages single spaced within the card. <laughs> yeah. And then when she joined, I was like, "There's no way I can live up to like the card she wrote us when she before she got hired yeah. even." Yeah. And so then I was just like. Thanks, David. I was like, I'm not even going to try. I'll just phone this one in more than anybody. Yeah. Well, when I saw it, I became instantly envious, you yeah. know. Um, I was like, is this a papyrus? And you're like, no, this, she made this for me. I was like, oh, holy cow. I did. I did. That hire, was, that, hire that lady. That was, that was like the point of no return. That was like interview three. I was like all in. And we, we ended that interview and I literally just went directly into my studio. I was like, I'm going to make this guy an awesome card. <laughs> I'm going to go go to the post office tomorrow. He will have this in his mailbox like 2 days later. It's wow. going to be great. <laughs> well, you you landed like full impact, you know, like after that card came, there was like 6 of us that were huddled around and we were like, "Good night. Who is this person?" <laughs> <laughs> and and you still managed to live up to the hype, you know, when we finally, or I got a chance to interview you. So again, super happy you're here. You're yeah. going to do great things at Digital. We're lucky to have you. Thank well, you thanks, so much. Chelsea. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you.